Today, we have a research review with our chief science officer, Dr. Brandon Roberts. We get into two really cool and applicable topics today, one which is highly debated in the industry and in the fitness space as a whole. We kind of have these two camps, right? We have this blood and guts need to train to absolute failure, go hardcore in the gym, bro. And then we have this group that is uh, shy and doesn't want to get too close to failure and really wants to recover and feel nice, warm, and fuzzy inside. Uh, the reality is, is that you should be somewhere in the middle. And we both kind of came to this this uh, conclusion at the by the end of the, the podcast today. But there are times and places to go to failure. There's also times and places where it's really dumb to go to failure and, and your injury risk goes up. Um, so there's a fine line to be had between the two of staying far away from failure at certain times and going all the way to failure at certain times and utilizing failure as a tool to learn how hard you should be training, period, because it gives you the information and the data needed to even use an RPE scale. So today we're going to kind of talk about the date between the debate between going to failure and not going to failure and what the research actually shows. We actually get into a specific study today that talks about about this specifically. Um, so it's a really good study. And then we dive into setting goals and setting smart goals. And, and this idea of, of New Year's resolution, since we're fresh into the new year, it's only January, a lot of people are starting to wind down and already quit their New Year's resolutions. But there are going to be some individuals that make it all the way to December, check off the boxes and complete their big goals that they set at the beginning of 2021. But what are those things that those people are doing? What are the habits incorporated? And what are the, the strategies, the methods, and the characteristics of these individuals who do make it to the end of the year and actually accomplish their goals? And what percentage of people who set those New Year's resolutions actually get there? We're going to break that down today because we have another study that is literally done on people doing New Year's resolutions. I think you're really going to like this episode. These are some of my favorite ones because we take the science and then we break down the application of those scientific research studies. Um, if you like this show, make sure you do me a huge favor. Hit the subscribe button. If you enjoy it that much, hit that little red bell so you can get notified every time we drop uh, a new podcast episode. And of course, like the damn video, comment below on what you want to see next. And most importantly, if you're not subscribed to the Tailored Life Podcast Clips channel, where you can see all of our podcasts broken down into mini episodes that are five to 10 minutes long typically, just to get the sound bites and the meat and potatoes of each episode, the good information packed little clips where you're not sitting in a car listening for an hour and a half. Uh, you can check out that channel as well. Hit subscribe, get notified over there too. There's a link in the description. And without any further ado, let's talk to the Tailored Coaching Method CSO, Dr. Brandon Roberts. All right, let's uh, let's get into this, man. Um, like I said before we start recording, I'm excited about this one. I always get excited for the research reviews, honestly, because I think one of my favorite, like people ask me all the time what I, like, what I read, what am I studying right now, what I'm reading. And I probably read like weightology, mass research reviews, stuff like that more than anything else now, um, as a coach and a practitioner whose job isn't to be living in the research, but really enjoys it and just coaches people or wants to teach our coaches how to coach people better. Um, stuff like this is always so cool. So um, I guess I'm just excited and grateful that we do it on our team now, but uh, let's, let's really just, I mean, people know what we do it by now. So let's just jump right into the first one, which is something I'm excited about. What's the first study we're getting into? Yeah, so this one is um, pretty recent. Uh, it's basically on failure versus non-failure. And the main kind of outcomes are based on muscle hypertrophy, which is, you know, what we care about. Um, so there was a meta-analysis published like literally three days ago on this topic. And I haven't had a chance to analyze it fully. Uh, so at some point, you know, I'll add that into the blog. But, you know, for purposes of discussion, um, this was a really well-designed study. Um, so it had kind of your average healthy young male. Um, they had a good bit of training experience. So a lot of studies in this topic are on untrained people. And it's like, well, you know, you're going to gain a lot no matter what. Um, so it's nice to see that. Now, what they did was they used a, what we call a within subjects design. So there was one participant and you have two legs, right? So you assigned, they assigned one leg to failure training with leg extensions and leg press. And the other leg they did short of failure. Um, so they didn't really define it, but th it ended up being like a two rep difference. So for comparison purposes, it's failure versus like RPE eight ish um, on average. So that's, that's also very applicable. And they're using 75% uh, of 1RM. So again, very similar to something you would do in the gym. Now, 
the kind of addition or the bonus on this study is they did something where they added 20% of volume to your sets. So you essentially, if you did, you know, 10 sets per week, you would now do 12 sets per week on each leg. Um, so it's like a little kicker, a little, little kind of bonus hypertrophy thing in there. Um, so they trained for two days a week for 10 weeks. And then they measured muscle size, um, muscle kind of angles and length. Okay, it's two things you don't really see often. Um, and then one rep max. So pretty straightforward design, um, pretty straightforward outcomes. So when they looked at uh, volume, just volume, like how, how did they compare? How close were they? There was about an 11% difference in volume between the legs. So, you know, that's, that's not a ton of volume, but it's enough to make a difference you would expect. Um, now, when they looked at muscle hypertrophy, um, they both changed about the same amount. So there are no differences between legs or between groups. When they looked at kind of percentages, which so you're kind of looking at percent change there, I think there was like a 3% difference, but, or five, maybe it was 5%, um, but it wasn't enough for you to go, okay, well, I really need to train to failure to get that extra three, per, three to 5%. Um, so that was kind of the take home on the hypertrophy side. On the strength side, um, they actually found pretty much no differences there. So, you know, that's not surprising given the meta-analysis that was just published on strength. Um, it also gives kind of a, a little practical side too, because if you look at power lifters or super strength athletes, they're not trained as a failure. Um, so this tells us, okay, we can get as strong as we need to get. And we can also maybe save some recovery or something like that. Um, so that was kind of the short and sweet of the study. They did one other thing where they measured muscle activation. So this is done via EMG. Uh, and this has to do with motor units. And the idea in training to failure is you want to recruit all of your motor units, thus recruiting all of your muscle fibers. Okay. Now, when you think about exercising, you don't recruit all of your motor units or muscles at once. Otherwise you would just like, I don't know, spaz out essentially. If you're doing a leg extension, you would just fire everything and, and kick. Um, so there's some modulation. And when they looked at EMG activity between the groups, they didn't really see any differences. Well, they didn't see any differences. So that's also saying going a couple reps short of failure is activating all the muscle that you really need to activate to grow and to get stronger. Um, so that's, again, that's pretty much the, the study. So. so first question I have, I think more just so the listeners can get kind of an insight. What's yeah. the reason behind splitting it up? Like, so instead of you do two reps shy of failure, I do two failure. It's like splitting. And I'm assuming it's a genetic thing. Like let's control the genetic component of this, but is that basically why they're just doing unilateral work here? Yeah. So it's, it's not like ideal in some sense, because you're right. Like it's not a randomized controlled trial where you can really, really extrapolate, but you do take out the genetics component. You take out the food component. So now you don't have to worry about, Hey, this group ate 10 to 20 grams more protein. Uh, maybe this group slept more or some of the variables that you kind of have to be concerned about as a, as a researcher are just gone. Um, so that's kind of a really nice aspect. What is the experience of the lifters? And, and I guess this is a question for all failure training, because there's quite a bit of tr research coming out now. Mm -hmm. I think this question is like, it's such a highly debated question amongst lifters. There's like, there's like the blood, it's sweat and tears group. That's like, you know, blood and guts, you have to go to failure. And then there's a the group that's like, stay away from failure so you can recover, man. Like, let's chill. And then there's kind of a middle ground. Like I'm in the middle ground. I feel like I like to go to failure sometimes on certain things for certain reasons. But um, what is the experience level of the athletes? You might've already said it in this study. And then what is the overall theme across most of these studies that we're seeing? Like how experienced are lifters there? Yeah. So in the, in the untrained, obviously they have, they have no training experience, but in this study, they had like five years of training and that's doing legs twice per week. Right. And if you're serious about getting big and strong, you're doing legs twice a week. Like, yeah. Honestly, at some point you are maybe like, not like every single week, but most weeks you're doing like it's twice a week. Yeah. Um, and the other kind of application aspect is they were doing roughly 
four to five sets of a leg extension and leg press twice a week. So that kind of, you know, if you look at your standard hypertrophy program, that relates really well there too. Um, yeah. I think I generally do, well, I don't do them anymore, but I used to do four to six sets for extension and then like probably the same for uh, leg press. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that uh, having five years is actually really cool because one of the arguments I was going to make is that as you get more advanced, maybe you need to push it closer to failure. But then the mm-hmm. other side of it is the further you get away from being advanced, I think the harder it is to determine where failure is. And, and, you know, I've been lifting for 10 years now and I recently had to do a, uh, it's kind of like an RPE test. It's for this sports nutritionist certification I'm going through. Um, and essentially we did one on the assault bike and then we did one with, uh, I, I chose the dumbbell bench press. And then the other one, I chose a leg extension, but it's basically like, Hey, we want you to get your heart rate to this place and go to an RPE of eight or 10 or whatever it may be. And you, you have this kind of like formula of like, all right, if I need to hit this RPE for this many reps, I need to put this much weight on based on like my one rep max. This makes sense. So I put it on there and every single time I did way more reps than I was planning on doing. <laughs> so it just goes yeah. to show that even like in, in these tests, I think they do a good job from my understanding is like they make sure people are going. But my argument is less about this study being accurate because I think from what I've heard, I haven't been in the research, so you'd be out better to say this, but I've heard that like they push you in these lab studies. So like if they want you to get to failure, like you're fucking failing, you know, they get you there. Um, So I trust the study. I think the problem with trusting the theory with the general population is I think it's a totally different ball game. Like even myself, like unless I'm with my brother-in-law who I train with, who is way bigger and stronger than me, like I don't go as hard as I need to go. And so I'll say this is an RPE eight, but then that same RPE eight ends up being, four more reps when he's with me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And there's, so there's, a, again, like you mentioned, a lot of factors to consider. This is probably one of the better studies because the other studies in trained people will stop like four to six reps short of failure. So then obviously there's going to be a difference. Um, and the meta-analysis that uh, I think Schoenfeld was on, I don't remember who the lead author was, but that just came out basically found no difference unless you looked at the trained population. And then there was like this tiny, tiny difference favoring failure. And you're like, okay, well, you know, maybe it's that the more trained you are and you have motivation factors like music. Um, there's a couple of studies that show if you put a person of the opposite sex in the room, like you perform like 10% better. <laughs> um, yeah. If you, you know, your, your caffeine, your all kinds of different aspects. Um, so we have to consider those and I'm kind of with you in the, in the middle section where I'm like, okay, I don't always want to train for t- to failure because I can't recover from that anymore. Um, maybe I could like in college, but now I'll pick my spots either last set or, you know, every end of the week, that's maybe the second, second session. Like if I'm doing legs twice a week, it'll be the second session I'll do to failure. Um, so something like that. I think, you know, you, you definitely made some good points and there's a lot of research to be done because the studies currently are mainly in like the biceps, right? And this one's in the quads essentially, right? But we don't know if there's a difference between muscle groups necessarily in recovery status. So maybe with your biceps, you can go to failure because I don't know, you just get a little bit of sore, but with your legs, you're like dying. (laughs) So you don't want to go to failure. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's exercise specific too, right? Like I know for me, I will purposely be like, all right, I'm doing dumbbell ladder raises. I'm going to go to failure because I'm grabbing like 15, 20 pound dumbbells and I'm going to do 15 reps and I end up doing 25 and it's like, okay, great. Um, But when like I did, uh, I'm doing like a conjugate style program. So there are some days where I do go to like today's one rep max, you know, and uh, this week it was front squat and I did the front squat to my absolute one rep max and but when I watched the video, I was like, damn, I actually like moved kind of quick. Like I probably could have went heavier, but I didn't. Cause I was like, I know that was truly like an RPE nine and I could go to 10, but like, why there's no reason. Cause it, in the back squat, it would even be more, I'd even be more serious about that. Cause you're more likely to hurt yourself. But, mm-hmm. um, I think after that I had like single leg landmine offset RDLs, right? Like I'll go close to failure. Cause worst case, I'm just going to drop the fucking bar 
from the landmine. You know, it's not like yeah, it, yeah, nothing yeah. crazy that's compressing my spine or anything like that. Yeah, I'm I'm the same way. Some stuff I'll if it's safe I'll take it to failure. Like it, it doesn't matter too much. Um, but you mentioned a good a good tool, and that's videoing yourself. So there's a lot of data on velocity based training, and you know if you get deep into it, you'll you'll see that there when you lose about 40% of your velocity, like if you're trying, um, that's about where, you know, you need to stop. Um, so I use it, I don't use it as much anymore again, cause I don't really squat or even bench anymore, hardly, but, um, you can record yourself and then look at it and say, okay, it felt like it a nine, but the bar is flying. So maybe I'm just, I need to RP test out again or something. I find that the case pretty often with me. To be honest with you, like, yeah, I'll finish the lift and be like, man, that was a grinder. And then I watch the video and I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> I got yeah. up just fine. Um, this is the, I don't even know if they have any research on this, but it would be an interesting question because I know not necessarily because I care about it, but I think clients always want to know what burns the most calories. Do you think, or is there any research to show that going to failure would actually burn more calories? Because one of the reasons, I mean, obviously we tell people focus on your diet for fat loss, focus on training for hypertrophy and strength. Um, but there are people that are like, well, if I can burn more calories from my workout, I want to, cause my main goal is fat loss. And the, the thing that would make me believe like, maybe that's the case is like, you think of when somebody first starts CrossFit, they usually get pretty damn lean. Right. And they're taking a lot of sets to failure or to, maybe not even failure, but like so close to failure because it's like, all right, this is a 10 minute AMRAP and you just keep going and going and going. You're like, holy shit, I did way more than I thought I could. So I guess what I'm saying is like, one, do you think it burns more calorie? And two, like maybe purposely pushing to failure um, more. So you get closer to that actual absolute failure to burn more calories. Like, would that even be justifiable? Um, so you, I mean, you're doing more work, so you are burning more calories. The, the percentage of that, like maybe across the whole workout. So let's say you did legs, everything to failure versus non to failure. And you did four exercises. I mean, it might be like 50 calories, maybe, maybe, maybe less. Um, so, and, and maybe it's worth it with like lower weights. Like we don't care as much about strength and you're just like pumping them out, um, but I would be, I'd be a little cautious with that. Uh, but it most likely does burn more calories to answer your question. And, and just while we're on this topic, so I think this will be helpful for people. Um, how effective is Epoch? Like when that first was like a thing, it was like, oh, like we got to do high intensity because your heart rate keeps going, you know, and it's, it's, it's a thing, but it's not as important as we once thought it was. Right. So like, and the reason I say that is because I know a lot of people get confused when they realize like you really don't burn that many calories training, especially like strength training. Yeah. Um, and it can be confusing because they're like, well, I burn more calories doing cardio. Why do I want to strength train kind of thing? Um, so that's a good question to answer as a whole, but with the failure piece, the reason I thought of it was like going to failure. Like if you ever do a, a set of squats to failure or, or an AMRAP session, like your heart rate is going through the fucking roof compared to just doing four normal sets or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was a, back in the day, there was a whole like fascination with, uh, EPOC. So it's the exercise post oxygen consumption. And it's kind of like during resistance training, you're burning up a lot of oxygen. You're kind of using it in your system to put it really lightly. Uh, and you have to kind of reestablish homeostasis and, and recalibrate, right? So then after you stop working out, it kind of comes back to normal. And there is a difference between kind of not doing resistance training and doing it, but it's, it's like, like 15 to 30 calories or something. It's really not much at all. Um, but if you look at acutely, right? So if you're only looking at the window, like an hour before exercise an hour after you're going to burn more calories maybe in your endurance training. Right. But then to make up for all that extra stuff, when the resistance training, you've got to not only recover that oxygen. So that takes an extra like 30 minutes after your workout, but then you've got to do all of the repair and other processes. And that takes a lot of energy too. Like it takes a lot of energy to build muscle. 
Yeah. yeah. So that, that's kind of the short and sweet of it. Um, well, maybe we'll have to do an epoch study so we can get a little more explanation in it in the future. Well, what do you, what is the thing that you tell people? I have like my like few answers that I use pretty repeatedly, but what is your answer to people when they ask like, why like more gen pop people get confused with this, but like, why would I train for strength and hypertrophy if all I care about is fat loss? Ooh. Okay. So my general answer is you care about fat loss, but if there's no muscle underneath that fat to show, you're going to be really disappointed. Um, so if you just diet and do cardio, you're probably, especially if you diet fast, you're probably going to either lose a little muscle or a lot of muscle. Now, if you just diet and do a combo, that's, that's probably the best. If you just diet and do resistance training, you know, there's a potential for recomp. Um, it's just better for your health too. Uh, so the, it, a combination of those types of things. Do you, do you think adaptation like plays a role in this? And what I mean by that is, uh, like typical list cardio is easier for your body to adapt to than strength training because there's so many ways to progress strength training for people. Yeah. Yeah. So you do adapt a little bit to, um, like regular list training, like walking on the treadmill or whatnot, uh, you get more efficient and stuff like that. But if you're in the weight room, you're constantly, hopefully progressing, right? So you're always challenging your body, growing, getting stronger. And so that's more of a challenge than just adding like 10 minutes of cardio. Right. And then there's also like this upper limit of, Hey, I can add more weight and get stronger, but I can only add so much time of cardio or so much intensity. And there's that trade-off too. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question on the failure training before we move on. Um, you kind of brought up powerlifters and how powerlifters rarely ever go to actual fa failure. They're usually training in like the 80 to 95% at most, you know, like um, range and in, in, I don't, I'm not aware of any studies on this, but from my perspective, it's like, well, you do that, you're going to be able to recover better and you're going to be able to go back and do that. And you're going to get the same strength gains from 80 to 90% as you would from and you do hundred percent. It's just that you can do it more consistently to keep building strength. Right. And then when you need to test and go to hundred percent, you do. Um, so there's a, there's a central fatigue or a global fatigue aspect of it. Um, do you think that that's the biggest reason to avoid failure? Cause a lot of the people who advocate failure are purely training hypertrophy and they're usually doing really high reps. So part of me goes, well, that's not nearly as neurologically fatiguing as going to failure with a three rep. So, um, I mean, so there's, there's another caveat here, right? There's so many different caveats, but do you think that's the biggest thing that you have to be aware of when going to failure is kind of this like stimulus to fatigue ratio? Yeah. And there's, it, it's hard to explain really, because I mean, so it's neural, right. For the most part, especially like three rep max and lower. Um, but we don't really know why it's so fatiguing. Like the, the definition and research behind central fatigue is kind of murky still. Mm. Um, so I never have a great answer for people who are like, well, I mean, you're right. You're like completely right. Like going hypertrophy training versus strict like powerlifting. You don't want to go to failure when you're powerlifting, especially not in your big lifts, but your accessory lifts, you could probably go to failure, maybe a little bit occasionally, right? You need to grow muscle. So it, it, it does do that. Um, but I see that too. So I think, I think you're right. And I would just say, be careful how you do your accessory training. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give a couple like brief bullet point recommendations on failure training, and then you can agree with me or add to it or disagree with it and just kind of give your thoughts on it. But, um, number one, I think you should assess injury risk before determining how close to failure you should go. So what I mean by that is a back squat, like we said earlier, a back squat has a higher injury risk than a dumbbell bench press, right? Or a dumbbell curl. So look at those things in, in first, because the injury risk is obviously the biggest component of like not wanting to go feel and hurting yourself because then you can't go back to the gym. Um, the other aspect of it is this central fatigue, which is like you said, kind of murky, but just kind of use common sense. I really like the whole stimulus to fatigue ratio thing that Mike Israel kind of coined, but like if I go into the gym and somebody asks me like, what's going to fatigue you more volume equated a deadlift or 
that dumbbell bench press. And it's, it's always going to be a deadlift. Deadlift is just more fatiguing. Um, and you know that whether it's central or it's muscular or like psychological, who knows, but you know, at days after heavy deadlifts, like you feel it days after curls or dumbbell bench press, you've completely forgot you even did it. So assess that as well. The, the more central fatiguing something is, or the more you feel like it's going to make you fatigued after the session, um, probably you should give yourself that wiggle room of like a RPE eight RPE nine at most. And then like things that are far have a better stimulus fatigue ratio, high stimulus. Like for me, dumbbell bench press is probably my favorite chest exercise. I just, I just feel it the most. Um, but I'm rarely like super sore afterwards or feeling like just dead after doing a few sets of them. Um, so that would be a good one to take to an RPE nine or 10, or, or even trying to go to failure and maybe realize like I could do more than I thought I could um, in the first place. And then lastly, looking at like your entire lifestyle, because, you know, I see some people talk about like, actually Jeff Nippert, I, I recommend everybody check this out. Jeff Nippert just did a, like, he did a YouTube video where he like, he interviewed Mike Isertel, Eric Helm, Steffi Cohen, and I think somebody else, I can't remember. Oh, John Meadows. Um, and he asked this question, like, should you train to failure? How, like, how high should your intensity be? And, and then he took all the answers and made podcasts out of them because all the answers were really long, but he made like a small YouTube video. Um, it was actually really interesting hearing like the different perspectives because like Steffi Cohen's like, I go to failure every time I train, but she trains the deadlift every two weeks, right? Her compounds are cycled in two weeks. So it's like, okay, well, that adds a different layer, right? Mm -hmm. And then John Meadows is a bodybuilder, old school. That's like, everything is high intensity, go to failure as hard as you can. Eric Helms is very balanced in between, right? Mike Isertel is very scientific with RIR and RPE and doing more volume. So really cool hearing the different perspectives. Um, but in general, I think like, if you look at John Meadows or even Steffi Cohen and you go like, well, there, look at them and they're going to failure. It's like, okay, look at their lifestyle. What do they do? They literally just lift and create content, right? They're out of school. They don't work normal jobs anymore. And more power to them. Like even myself, I can probably go to failure more than most people because I spend my day in the gym every day, right? And I create yeah. content every day. Like before I had Blakely, fuck, I could go to failure every day and be fine. <laughs> With a two-year-old, I can't. So look at your lifestyle and, and determine like, like stress is stress. So if, if you're already having external stress in your life through work, family, relationship, all that kind of stuff, maybe staying a little bit shy of failure is actually even more important for you because like going back to the, the central fatigue thing, which we don't know exactly what it is to me, fatigue is fatigue, stress is stress. So if we do consider it as a psychological or neurological thing, it's not just about training at that point. Muscular fatigue is mainly about training, right? I'm not, my muscles aren't going to be sore from me having to work really hard at on my desk <laughs> job, you know, yeah. but, but my brain will be. So, um, those are kind of like my three recommendations when, when going to failure. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. That was, that was a really good, like summary and practical application. I, I don't have anything specific to add. Um, you know, it, it's good to reassess that throughout different points in your life, like you mentioned. So, and as you age, cause you don't recover the same as you age as I'm figuring out now. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much it though. Love it. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, it can be confusing. I know for a while I got confused by this research because it was like, okay, but that says like, as long as I'm like three reps shy of failure, I'll get the same results. But all these people's experience that I look up to says that you have to like go really, really close to failure. And ultimately I've determined that you just don't really understand what failure is unless you're in the lab doing a research. And, and that's coming from somebody who trains all the time. And I, I admitted it, like I was far from failure without realizing it, you know? And that's what it is. And, and the video thing that you mentioned, like that's huge because when you, and that was part of the, the homework actually I had to do, I had to film it. So you, and then I got to see, and I was like, and I swear I couldn't do one more rep, but that didn't look that bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of the things to check yourself is just to like pause for a second or two. Like if you're curling, for example, it's, it's an easy one, just pause like after you're set and then keep going like a couple seconds later and see how many more you can get. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's perfect. All right. Uh, second study for today. Okay. So it's, uh, February ish. So I figured it would be good to cover the study. This one actually has made the rounds, I think already in social media, but it's a new year's resolution study. And, um, it's one of the biggest studies 
on the topic that's been published. It was actually done in, I think, 16, 2016 to 2017. So it's a little bit older now, but um, still very modern. Uh, and it was not done in the States. It was actually done in Sweden. So that's a, another little caveat. So New Year comes and people make resolutions. And this is due or this phenomenon, right, is called the, the fresh start effect. And it's just the idea that people like to have a fresh start, right? They like to categorize things into different periods. So most people will start diets or anything really on a Monday, right? Or the first of the month or the first of the year. And that's just so we can break it down into little segments. It doesn't really matter. Like if you want to start dieting, just start today. Don't wait until Monday. Um, but so what this study did was they put out a bunch of surveys or um, not surveys, but uh, participation requests on social media. And they said, hey, we're looking for these people um, to participate in a study on New Year's resolutions. And studies in the past have given people categories of like pick your resolution type thing. Uh, but this study didn't. They kind of let people free respond and then they bulked them all together. Uh, so once they did that, everybody had their, their resolutions in. Then they randomized them to one of three groups. So the first group received kind of like some information at, at the beginning. So in January, they got some information about like how to achieve goals and, and stuff like that, very brief. Uh, and they were followed up with at the end of the year, so December. So basically, actually it was in July, so six months mark, and then the December. So they only had two follow-ups, no support. Uh, and that was kind of the control group. Uh, and the second group had some support. So they gave them the same information, but actually uh, some more on top of that. They then had them pick someone to kind of hold them responsible. Um, and they followed up with them at the end of each month, right? So they're, they're sending out surveys. They're like, hey, how is your goal going? How is, you know, how is stuff going? Rate this on a scale of zero to 100, success, not success, um, things like that. And then the third group uh, was called like the extra support group. So they received the same as the second group. So they got reminders once a month. They got a bunch of information, but they were told to do things and they had a, someone responsible for like holding them responsible for their resolution, but they were framed differently. So what they did is they had people create SMART goals. So those are specific, measurable, achievable. Um, oh man, what's the R? Realistic. Yeah, realistic and time-based. So it's a good way to do goals. It's been like that idea has been around for a while. Yeah, long term. Um, and so they had them do that and they had them create interim goals. So like, hey, at six months, I want to do this or this or this. Um, and they followed up with it, right? And so they did that for the whole year. And at the end of the year, they kind of had their data. And it took them a while to write it up. But uh, kind of matching the literature, most New Year's resolutions, if you just look at what people pick, have to do with health or weight loss, right? So like, I think almost 30 to 35% of the, the people had one of those two goals. Like they wanted to be, be healthier or lose weight. And then the third one is actually very close to that. So it's eating. So it's something to do with eating. Like I want to eat more vegetables or, you know, I want to eat less out or in. And then the last two main goals that they had were self-improvement. So personal growth, which is pretty common, um, but it was like 10%. And then the very last one, which is, kind of odd they grouped mental health and sleep together um i think those are two separate things but separately they wouldn't probably be more than a couple percentage points um ooh, i don't know what that was anyway um okay so those are the main um kind of goals that people had so as they're following these people up across time basically they start out the first uh, checkup is a month in. People's responses are dropping off. Like they're like, oh no, like I'm just not following up with you. I send you an email, you just don't respond, right? You're part of a study, it's fine. Um, and so over time, the 
response rate dips, and then it comes back up right at the end of the year, right? They're like, oh, snap, I got I to gotta do this thing. Um, and their success rate, right, across all the groups decreases, uh, you know, from 90% of the first month down to like 60% by the end of the thing. That's, that's all the groups together. Now, if you look at their success rate and you, and you look at the different groups, this is the kind of important part. Uh, the, the group with no support had the least success. So they rated their success. So it wasn't someone like saying, hey, you did a good job. It's like, how did I succeed? Did I or did I not? Uh, so 55-ish percent of people in the control group succeeded, which is still pretty good. Like, yeah. it's pretty good. More than I thought. Uh, yeah, no, I was expecting like 20 or 10 or something. Um, so when they looked at the some support group or like the, the middle one that got a little bit of support, um, they ended up around like 60%, I want to say, somewhere in there. And the, actually, no, it was like 65%. And then the extended support group ended up right around 60%. So statistically, there was not a difference between those support groups. Um, both of them were better than the control group, obviously. But the, the middle group, the one that didn't have like as much information at the interim goals, they didn't have smart goals, you know, they didn't do quite as well. Um, and so that was kind of looking at the, the results. That's pretty much the results of the study. Now, when we kind of interpret this data, you're like, wait a second, you're telling me that group three got all of this support, all this information, all this follow-up and they didn't do better. Well, why not? First thing I thought, I'm like, that, that seems ridiculous. Like as a coach, you can tell like the people who are in it and don't drop out and get all of the information they need, they, they do better, right? Um, so what they, they kind of speculated and what a lot of people are speculating off the study is because their goals were so like specific, if they didn't succeed, like they didn't say, you know, I wanted to lose 10 pounds and then they lost like seven and a half. They're like, nope, didn't get my goal. And you're like, well, that's not really fair, but I mean, I guess it is if you made a smart goal. Um, so I think there's, there's a couple of things we can kind of take away from the study. It's that, you know, we do want to use smart goals, but we kind of want to keep in mind that you can be successful and not like a hundred percent and still kind of achieve your goals, right? If, if you're losing weight and you lost seven and a half, eight pounds instead of 10, like that's still a big W. Um, and the more we know about kind of the information around goals, setting goals, interim goals, like those things are always going to help um, your success rate in pretty much any of these things. Because it's not just weight loss, right? It's, it's personal growth, it's sleep, it's mental health, it's whatever you want to do. Um, so I, I thought it was a really cool study. I Kind of surprising, but again, the reasons behind it make sense. Yeah, I was going to say that makes a lot of sense. It, it, it was funny listening because – at first, I'm like, oh, this will be good because it's going to show that, like, coaching, you need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trouble. And then you start saying that. I'm like, wait, what? That's not what <laughs> I wanted to say. <laughs> but it makes sense because I know even for me, like, all set – I'm really big on uh, setting 90 day goals is kind of what I do. And I do it with some of my clients and stuff too. And it's basically like in, in 90 days, this is what I'm going to achieve with the business, with my family relationship, with my fitness, and then with my mental health, my personal development, whatever I want to learn. Um, usually that's like, like for me right now, it's playing guitar and it's simply like, I need one, it's learning a new skill, but two, it's like step away from work and social media and everything and just chill for a little bit. Um, mental health. But I set these very, very specific targets. And it used to be the same thing. Like I would be like this close to hitting that financial target or this close to hitting that goal I had in the gym. And it was like, well, I'm, I fucking failed because I didn't get there. Right. But if I look at day one to day 90, it's like, I've grown so much, you know? So I think that now what I tend to do is I set ranges if it's a number based goal, which I think is really important. I had a conversation with a client the other day that he was like, he was really set on 20 pounds. And so I was like, well, let's do like between 15 to 20 within between like this many to this many weeks. And yeah. it's because at first he was like 20 pounds, 12 weeks. I'm like, 
how about 15 to 20 and 12 to 16? <laughs> like, because man, there's going to be weeks and he has a good amount of weight to lose. So it's like, there's going to be weeks you lose two pounds a week, dude, but there's going to be weeks you lose a half a pound, you yep, know, yep. and we just have to account for that. So um, I think those ranges are super helpful. And, and it's kind of taken that smart principle of like, it is still specific and it's still measurable, um, very realistic and achievable, but it's also not such a fine deadline that it can create that issue of failure, you know, or, or that potential of not quite getting there and then feeling like failure, even though you've succeeded a bunch. Um, so yeah, those results actually make a lot of sense when you put that explanation behind it, because I think it's, it goes without saying that there's actually a cool study. Um, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it was like, basically like the, uh, the likelihood of you reaching your goals if you have a, a certain degree of accountability i can't remember if it was like a weekly meeting with somebody or a monthly meeting or like a call or whatever it was but it was like it increases like 30 to 35 percent or something like that if you have some kind of accountability um and i think that goes without question i mean if you have somebody checking in on you or you have to check in with somebody or you know even like when i don't check in with my coach because i'm not always the best about making sure i send my update form knowing that he's, I'm going to talk to him again at some point and that I respect him. Like I do the work, you know, because that's like a level of respect accountability that I want to maintain. Yeah. Yeah. I think, so I do the same thing. Like with, with my coach, I'm like, he doesn't request an update every week. Like we'll, we'll do through the app and through text and stuff. Um, but sometimes I'll send him like an audio update and sometimes like it'll go three weeks and I'll be like nothing crickets. Yeah. Um, but I think, let's see, back to, back to the study a little bit. Um, you know, I always had a problem with setting goals that were like too lofty. And I would get, like you like you said, like 90% of the way there. And somebody else would look at your goal and your thing and they'd be like, dude, you like crushed it. And I'm like, nah, nah, I could have done better. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's always, th- then it becomes like, not worth having goals, right? If you're miserable because you don't hit your goals um, versus like making goals realistic, that's the realistic component, right? So if I say, I'm going to publish five papers this year, right? It's like, that's, mm, that's a big, that's a big reach. That's like, that's a really big reach. Um, So I would really have to push. And then at the end of the day, I'd probably be exhausted and probably publish four and a half or something. And the last one would be like in review. Yeah. Um, or I could say, you know, standard is like two a year for most scientists in our fields or in like in my fields, like I'm going to go for two, solid two, I feel good about it. Right. And then if I hit three, I'm like, yes, crushed it. And if I hit two, I'm like, okay. And if I hit one, I'm just more sad than I would have been before, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I like your idea of ranges. I've never really implemented ranges, but I think for some things, especially like money, and finance stuff and and weight loss, things like that. It makes a lot of sense. Now, like finishing like a certificate program or something like ranges don't necessarily make sense for that, but (laughs) if they're self-based, maybe they do. I don't know. Yeah. I think, you know, there's definitely a category of things like degrees and certificates, like you, you just do, or you don't. But I think that, you know, I remember talking to a guy um, about, uh, it was, it was kind of like a mentor of mine in a way. And he was like, man, I don't remember the last time I actually finished a book. And I was like, what? I thought you read all the time. He's like, oh, I read every day. I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. And he was like, well, why would I read a hundred percent of a book when I'm going to get like what I need out of it from like 10% of that book? And I was like, well, then what do you do? And he was like, well, if I'm deep into a chapter and it's not a chapter that's piquing my interest or giving me anything, I'm going to move to the next chapter or I'm going to read until I have the light bulb moment or like, most of the time with personal development books, you get a book, you know what the book is going to give you, right? So once you get that, just stop reading, right? And I used to be the type that was like, I need to read every word on every page in order to say that I finished that book. And then it was just like, well, why? So you can tell somebody you finished a fucking book. And it's like, I guess so, <laughs> you know? And yeah. and it was funny because I, uh, I had a, I think it was 4th of July, like a barbecue, a bunch of friends. And uh, one of my buddies I've known for a long time came over. He was like, oh, I want to see the house. I haven't seen it yet. So we're like showing around. I show him my office. And he looks at my bookshelf and he's like, holy shit, you've read all these books? And I was like, a little bit of every one of them. And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, I don't finish all these books. Like, and, and I had the same conversation, but in the reverse, I was in the shoes. And it was like, same thing. I'll read a book until I get that point where I need it. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because I think people listening can take this away. When you do something, 
audit your own ability, your own skill, your own knowledge, your own success rate after you do that task, whether you hit the goal, quote unquote, or not, right? So I didn't finish this book, but did I get something from it? Yes. Okay. It was worth that 20 bucks I spent on it, period. I won because I got something from this book. Um, I set a 20 pound weight loss goal, but I lost 15 and I looked leaner than I thought I would. And I feel really good. Is that a win? Do I feel better than I did when I started? Yes. Okay. That's a win. Maybe you will lose five more pounds. Maybe you don't need to, you know, um, which I will say usually, and you'll respect this as a bodybuilder. Usually if, if like, so I was talking to Hallie cause she brought on a client that, uh, wants to compete next year and it'll be her first competitor. And she's like, how do I set like a target for what weight she should step on stage? I was like, well, you and her talk, think about like her past cuts and all that kind of stuff. Um, determine what weight you think, like how much weight she could lose to get really fucking lean and then subtract five to 10 more pounds from that. So yeah. sometimes what I'm saying works in the opposite because I told, like I told my brother-in-law that too, he was doing a cut and he kept losing weight. He's like, I think I'll be like 185, like ripped. I was like, probably 170. And he's like, what? And I'm like, dude, just trust me. <laughs> just trust me. Yeah. I, I, the first, the first, first time I competed, I was one of those people. And then I looked at myself and I was like, dude, I could, I stepped on stage and I wasn't as lean. Like at the time, you know, it's like first competition. You, you don't want to go shredded glutes, right? Like it's just not a good time to do it. Um, and I was a solid 20 pounds under where I thought I would be. And I had the same conversation all the time. I'm like, you can, you can lose 10 pounds or hit your target, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be right. And oh. then once you do get down there, so I, when I coach competitors, I don't love to put timetables or goals on like the board. I kind of like to just say, Hey, we're going to go until either you are comfortable, you want to stop or like we're done with the season type thing. Like we, we, we got as lean as we could for as long as we could, we won or lost all the competitions. Um, cause people, yeah, people love to get numbers in their head and, and I'd rather them get it like an image, but they don't know what they look like that lean. Right. So one of the problems bod bodybuilders have is after you get that lean, you're like, Oh, I know what's under there. Like, why can't I walk around that lean? I'm like, well, it's a whole different yeah. issue. That's a whole different head case. Like I, I went through that same thing because so I'm sitting at like 174, 175 right now. At the peak of my bulk, I was like 185. When I stepped on stage, I was 153. <laughs> so just to paint some context, because people will look at me and they're like, you're pretty lean for now, you know, average person lean. But I could shave off another 20 pounds and I'd be like stage lean. Maybe because I, I mean, that was my first show. So who knows what I could have done, you know? Um, and I'm, that was years ago. So, um, but no, I think that's smart. Me, me and Eric Trexler actually just had this conversation because I had an end goal in mind, but we were like sometime between March and April. And it was like the same thing. It's like, there's no reason in setting a specific date for a photo shoot because you, I'm after a specific look and I know what that look is, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I'm currently dieting and I'm like 172. 171 right now um for for listeners reference i'm 58 and was all of 144 45 pounds on stage um but like i'm four weeks in and i'm hitting those like slumps where you kind of maintain that you drop two pounds or you drop and it's ah, i forgot how aggravating it is i'm like ah, i hate dieting <laughs> yeah and then you get a fluctuation and you're like what the fuck like yeah i'm up a pound <laughs> and it's like yeah i totally get it man i'm going through the same exact thing so um, well, cool. Let's wrap it up there. I think that was a good, uh, actually a really applicable research review for people to listen to. So um, I think both of those things are something that you guys could go rewind, write down some notes about just like how to set those goals. And then on the first one, like even just those bullets I left at the end, I mean, like take those and use those in your training because failure training is smart sometimes and really dumb sometimes. So um, there's a balance to be had like most things. But um, as always, man, thank you for your time. That was a really good research view. And we'll get this on the blog um, ASAP, guys. So if you're listening to this right now, it actually should be on the blog already as of yesterday. So we'll link that in the show notes uh, to make sure you can go check that out.